from sunny Southern California. This is the Executive Housekeeper 101 from housekeepingrehab.com. Here now is your Executive Housekeeper, Abel Josephson. And let me tell you where engineering directors do not go. Let me tell you where engineering supervisors do not go. Let me tell you where engineering employees, maintenance guys do not go unless you invite them, unless you tell them, unless you get them on the radio. Uh, uh, housekeeping to uh, engineering, copy. Uh, can you come fix this broken lamp in 319? Copy. Uh, Roger, we'll Cohen out. This is perfect. If you're aspiring or it's your goal to be an executive housekeeper, even a supervisor. Look, if you're an employee and you just started in housekeeping, you wanna know how some things work or how they can work, this is just for you. On this installment of the Executive Housekeeper 101, I'm going to talk about how to work with Director of Engineering, the maintenance department, how housekeeping and engineering interface, and how to get done what you need to get done without sitting around and waiting for them to get done what you need to get done. One of the things I'm going to do is tell you about my time as an engineer, as a maintenance man in a big downtown, big box, you know, big name, high brand hotel, business hotel. This hotel had 5,000, 6,000 square feet of banquet space or something, it was huge. Like two floors of banquet space, big building, 21 floors, 585 rooms downtown in a major U.S. city. They had a, a couple of restaurants, a lobby bar. They had a second floor that was kitchen just for banquets, just for banquets. The main floor kitchen was for room service and restaurant. So as an engineer, we, we covered a lot of ground. Plant maintenance, right? Your electrical systems, plumbing, plumbing systems, fire uh, systems, that sort of thing interior, exterior maintenance of the building, repairs inside and outside, plus running calls to all the guest rooms, plus guest room maintenance, plus swimming pool on the roof, plus blah, 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 big engineering department, big responsibilities. And I was an engineer there for a couple of years. I was an engineer there on my way to being what? The executive housekeeper. And did I know that? Oh, I did not know that at all. Let me tell you the story as we talk about how to work with the management team. I did the message on how to work with the GM. Now, I say a lot of things. It's not everything that can be said. Is it every, no, it's not everything that can be said. I'm hitting some big points, some of the finer points, some of the things you only learn by living it out. Nobody can teach you these things in hospitality school. Nobody can teach you this in orientation with HR. I have said many times in these videos, you, executive housekeeper, you are the director of engineering. Did you know that? You lead the maintenance team. Did you know that? I didn't know that when I started. In fact, I had no uh, mentors or models to follow after. I had never seen an executive housekeeper that did anything but frustrate because they couldn't get things fixed. They had to give rooms over, turn rooms over to guests, turn them over to the front desk, and they had broken face plates and curtains that didn't work and broken lamps and stuff. Why? They couldn't get them fixed. And when it's time to turn the room, you have to turn the room sometimes. But I never had that problem once I figured out the secret. What's the secret? Ding dong. I was the director of engineering many times. I know this. I know, I know, I know. Talked AC. I know. Housekeeping and engineering at are at odds. One can't tell the other what to do. And it's usually because the managers can't tell each other what to do. And that trickles down, it's the trickle down theory. What's in the heart and spirit of these people trickles down to these people and these people, right? So when these hearts up here, the managers are flowing and working in, in rhythm and in sync, guess what? Do, 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 flowing in rhythm, in sync, goes all the way down to the uh, hourly employee, the frontline associate. Okay, let me tell you my story. I had developed a strategy for my career and this was the strategy. I will take five years, I will methodically move from one department to the other in the rooms division. I don't care about food and beverage. I did work food and beverage banquets at Christmas and the holidays at night because you made time and a half every hour, right? And that was cool. I'm gonna work in the hotel for five years and I'm gonna work methodically through the departments methodically and transfer with consensus of my managers one department at a time. I applied though for a maintenance position, engineering, 
And they were like, that'd be great. I already had skills outside of the hotel business. I could hammer, nail, and saw. I could paint. I could do carpentry. I knew these things from work that I had done on the side for a few years. So they took me in and I just ate it up like an F-16 eats up the sky when it's flying about 100, 200 feet off the ground, bombing everything beneath it. I went after it, but my first role in the maintenance department was what? Running calls. Oh my God. Running calls, really? They made me run calls and eight hours a day, I strapped on a radio and I just walked around and I waited till somebody called and most of the calls were, the lamp is broken. They can't get their laptop plugged in. The toilet is clogged. The sink is clogged. The light is out. Change the light bulb. I changed light bulbs. The face plate is broken. Only about a month of this did I realize, oh my God, I don't like this. It is not challenging. I'm not using skills that I have. I'm just doing menial labor, small things. Small things that are important that must be done, but it was not challenging me. And one thing that I noticed is that every day I walked around the hotel from the 21st floor all the way down to the lobby, down five floors into the parking garage, I noticed what? Things that needed maintenance or repair. Listen to this. I started making punch lists. Now a punch list is just a list of things that need to be done. And you do one, you check it off, you go to the next one. You do that, you check it off, you go to the next one. Things or little projects that just need to be what? Punched out. A punch list. I would make my own punch list every day. Everywhere I was at, ooh, scratch on the wall, a gouge in the drywall, a nick in the wood finish, carpet that's pulling up, a ceiling that needs paint. We need to re replace some ceiling tiles in here. There's some water stains. The uh, wires are severed on a, you know, a, 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 what do you call those things? Treadmill. Anything that I could find is work that I could do that I was interested in, I made a list. And what I started do, to do was go to the director of engineering every morning and kind of get an idea of what he wanted me to do. Hey, uh, can you give me one or two things? There were no big deal. And then I would run calls the rest of the day. It was not demanding, challenging physically or even you know, mentally, spiritually. So I would say to him, hey, listen, I noticed that the carpet is pulled up on the 22nd or the 21st floor, right outside the elevator. I need to get that carpet done. Oh, okay, good, do that. Uh, also, I noticed that in the men's shower in the spa, uh, the shower head is leaking. I need to get some Teflon tape on that, clean it up and get that in. I started making lists of things I needed to do. What was good about this? He didn't have to manage me or supervise me. He knew I was looking for it. He knew I was finding it. He knew I was fixing it. And I was reporting it at the end of the day. Done, 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 done. Well, as you can imagine, the more I went around the building, the bigger my punch list became. I started categorizing plumbing, electrical, painting, uh, carpeting, woodwork. I categorized it. And I began to hand them back to the director of engineering. And then he would take like the electrical stuff and he would go to his guy in engineering that was his good electrician and he would say, here, here's a list of things to do, go do it. So that guy would do it. He had no idea that the list came from me. He would give the painter, look, here's touch-ups to do in every room, here's your room numbers, go do it. And come back when you're done. And then I would get the list after they checked off everything they did on the punch list. I would get the list and I would go what? Inspect what I expected. So I was finding the work. I was assigning the work. I was following up, inspecting what I was expecting, inspecting the work, and then turning that back to the director of engineering. And do you think they loved me? Yeah, because directors of engineering tend to be cave dwellers. Most of the time, they're in an office like executive housekeepers. They're not always in the product. They're on an as needed basis. The only time you'll see a director of engineering in the room or a supervisor in the room is if he's invited for some reason or if they've had a pipe break and there's an emergency in that room. They'll come up the day before or the morning that a, a, a corporate executive when the suits come from the Dallas or Miami, Chicago, New York, right, Atlanta, Cleveland, Seattle, LA, wherever the suits are coming, they're gonna be in your hotel for a night or two. Oh, the director of engineering will come and inspect the room, make sure something's not broken once so he didn't look bad. That's when they go to rooms. And that's where I learned that. That's okay. But as an executive housekeeper, you need them to come into the rooms, but they're not gonna come without an invitation and you can't invite them on every little thing. And why would you need them to come when you as an executive housekeeper spend 50% of your day 
in the product because you are the president of controlling quality. You're the president of quality control. So why wouldn't you take note of maintenance things and do for them what they will not do for themselves? And I, I'm not criticizing maintenance. They got stuff they gotta do. They won't come unless you call them. So when I became an executive housekeeper, I was already all over the hotel from the 22nd floor, 21st floor, whatever it was, all the way down to five floors b below the, the car park. I was already all over the hotel. That's where I spend 50% of my day, administration and stuff in the morning, after lunch, have a lunch, and then the rest of the time, I'm aggressively on the floor going boom, 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 into occupied rooms to make sure my service is A number one, five star, while my guests are there spending money every night. So while I'm already up there, what am I doing? I'm noticing all the maintenance issues. And what am I doing? Coming back down, putting my list together in the morning, uh, putting my list together, categorizing things, painting, electrical, plumbing, furniture repair, carpet repair, this, that, and the other. And then I'm getting that all sorted out and I'm taking it to the executive uh, or the uh, director of engineering and saying, look, uh, these are the rooms we need and this is what we need. Why? So they can give painting to one person and one color at a time. Don't give them six things that need paint in a room. For example, um, painting entryways. Let me show you how you do this. You give them one list and you give them a list of all the room numbers and you highlight the rooms that have entry areas that need touch up. Your entry areas need touch up more than anything. When the guest comes in, they close the door, they got their bags, they've got them over their shoulder, they got kids and they got boom, boom. They scratch and mark up the entryways. That's where most of your painting needs to happen, right? All that was required of the engineer that was gonna paint these or touch up these entryways was to take one color of paint he doesn't need a cart. He needs a bucket with some paint in it and a brush or a roller, right? He can put the little quart of paint down in a five gallon bucket and carry one thing and go in there, blip, blip, boom, boom, zip, bop, bop, pow. And then he simply dates the day that he did it and initials, puts his initials on there because sometimes I'll have a couple of people. You know, some people have days off and other people do it. And then every day he just turned that into me and I would mark it off my list in my office. And he would do this until we what? Highlighted every single room or painted or touched up every single room until every single room had received touch up in that area. Then what for the painter? We go to baseboards that were a different color. One color, one bucket, one brush, one roller. Here's 36 rooms that have baseboards that need to, to do things. I would provide them with maps of the rooms and mark where the marks were in each room. Why? Time management controlling the quality. He could focus on one thing and pretty much in one or two, maybe three days, he could get into every room that needed it. He didn't have to look for it. He didn't have to find it. He was given the list and a map to where the treasure was. He did it. Now, this is very important. After he's done, I would tell these engineers, when you're done, the minute you're done in this room that you're working on, call me. It'd take them 45 minutes an hour or whatever it was, call me. And so I would go every time he called, every 45 minutes or an hour to fix whatever he fixed. And I would expect inspect the work right then and there. Why? I don't need him dropping paint on the carpet and walking off. And I find out at three o'clock, I've got to turn the room. I've got people in the lobby and find out, yeah, but I got paint drops on the carpet. Oh no, sorry, Bob. I inspected it as soon as it was done. You call me the second you're done before you go to the next room. There was no trail of tears of mistakes left behind the engineer. What was I really doing? I wanted to be right there after you worked so hard to make the room good for me and my department and the guest. I wanted to be right there to go, man, your work is great. I love it. That looks great. Oh my God. You're so much better than the last guy. I hope there is not another guy. I constantly encouraged and appreciated and praised the work that these hard workers did. I thank them. I developed relationships with them. When you look at and study the efficiency of a factory assembly line, it's many people and each person does one thing over and over and over. When one person does one thing over and over and over, they become faster because their motion becomes less. They become more efficient with their use of time. They streamline all that they do. It's more effective, it's more efficient, it's faster. If you have one person going into a room with six things to do, you increase the odds that they will miss something or not do one thing efficiently. One job, one list, one objective. Quality control. I had my own way of making these 
you know, punch list for housekeeping and engineering. Anytime I was on the floor, I had a clipboard with me with rooms sheets. I just call them room sheet. It was just a single sheet of paper. It had a blank space. I could write the room number. And anytime I went into a room to inspect it, to turn it, or whatever I was doing in the room, I would look around and see if there were issues and I would write those down. The next morning, I would go and I would categorize all those things, this for housekeeping, this for engineering, and I'd make my punch lists. And then I'd turn my punch list over to engineering. After a while, you develop a relationship. The engineer checks with the, the maintenance manager, and then he moseys over to my office. We sit down and look at his work for the day. The guy running calls isn't running back and forth all over the building, hitting a whole hodgepodge of stuff. Why is that? not uh, efficient. It's not efficient because he's got to go get a part. So he's got to go 18 floors down and spend 15, 20 minutes looking around for the part. Then he's got to get the tool out of his locker. Then he's got to go back up to the room to fix it. And then he's got another issue I call him on in this room over here. Well, that needs a different part and a different tool. He's got to go back. Down. This is the guy running calls, right? Room 313 called and they need uh, the lamp fixed. Uh, can you check the toilet in 419? The guest is saying it's clogged up. You know, all that stuff. So I, I had him highly efficient. Here's your list. Here's all the rooms you need this tool for. Here's all the rooms you need that tool for. Here's five rooms you can get tooled up and go and boom, 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 boom. Then go downstairs. You can get your tools for the next category of project. Go up and hit six rooms. Boom, 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 and not have to go back and forth. And that's why I say you are the director of engineering. And no director of engineering that I ever met uh, was annoyed by this. They, will, they were thankful for it. Why? They don't go into rooms unless you invite them. You would think they would, but they don't. So if you're an executive housekeeper bitching and moaning because engineer, engineering won't fix things, they won't fix things because they don't have the time to walk down the building. That's what you do, so accept it and do it so that you have clout, so you can go to your general manager if they won't fix things and say, look, I've organized it for them. It's all right here. They can take one guy and do six things without having to retool. Remember, you always go to your general manager. This is all about working with managers. General manager, he's the quality control, the controlling of quality with his managers. Having been a general manager, I understood this, so I understood how to work this myself and build relationships. I can't say how much important it is. Build relationships. Be thankful for the maintenance engineer. Be thankful for the director of engineering. These are your best colleagues, your best friends. Anyway, okay, all right, close the back on that. Let me get on to something else. Okay, now I'm going to tell you why things don't get fixed even though you reported them. And I'm going to tell you why people just don't report problems. I mean, you were in this room and you saw that and you didn't tell anybody and we checked a guest into that. Supervisor, I'm talking to a supervisor, you saw that and you just let it go. Oh, it is because engineering, you call them and they do not come, they are too busy, blah, 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 no. How many of you have these work orders and these work order systems in your hotel, right? You put the room, what the little problem is they need to fix, who it's assigned to, it's a three-part document. You fill it out and you uh, hang your little slip on your little wall and then the other two are given to engineering, They, the engineer takes his little part of that three-part document and his little copy and he hangs it on his wall and then the third copy is put into a file or given to the general manager or whatever right what happens is is that maintenance issues just begin to balloon they get worse and worse things aren't fixed the place is and constantly being chased like a nine-headed snake they can't get a handle on anything so usually general manager comes in whoa god we've got to get a a reporting system down and fix these maintenance issues. Well, let me explain something to you. This is a problem because here's what happens. They're gonna call the director of rooms, order of uh, 16 cases of three part work orders. And I want all the departments to put up a board with little nails for each room and each room is gonna get a work order. We're gonna be able to look on a board and see every room in the hotel and what maintenance issues. And then boom, we get onto our staff. Now you gotta turn in these work orders. If you see anything, you gotta fill this out, give it to supervisor. Supervisor's gotta give it to the manager. The manager's gotta give it to engineering. Engineering's gotta take his part, put it on the little nail. <laughs> this copy goes to the general manager so he can, woo, crack the whip and get all the maintenance problems fixed. No, 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 no. Here's the problem with that. As soon as they put in the work order system, there's a glut of reporting. It's massive. 
director of engineering looks up one day and he's got a little half inch stack, you know, you know, 200 little slips that, cause sales got their work orders and they got things that need to be done in their office and food and beverage and front desk, engineering's got their own set of work orders, housekeeping's got God knows how many work orders, right? Reservations need some wires run for a computer, right? And they get overwhelmed and then they don't know how to categorize them and take the, the one problem that affects the most rooms and fix and eradicate that first. Because you see when you do that, it's like, what's more important? You have 100 rooms, you have five rooms with air conditioners that do not work. It's 82 degrees in there all the time. The guests squeal and complain. Five rooms, but you have 100 rooms, but you've got 61 rooms that don't have ashtrays. I know nobody smokes in hotels anymore, but let me use that as an example because nobody cares if there's an ashtray, but let's say it's your hotel standard. You got 67 rooms that need ashtrays and you got five that need AC. I'll ask anybody on board, what's the priority? Priority here. I'm picking ashtray because it doesn't seem important. But I have 67 rooms that don't have an ashtray, and it's a, it's a standard. And I have five rooms that basically don't have AC worth of shit. And I ask people, what's more important as a priority, ashtrays or air conditioning? 100% of the time, they'll say air conditioning, man. You can't have a guest in there, you know, without cool air. He's got children or old people, you know, elders, old people, you know, senior citizens in there, whatever. If it doesn't matter if you're 30 years old, it's hot and it's hot as hell and you can't sleep. What's the most important thing? 100% of the time they'll say ACs. Why is that answer wrong? Because if I fix the air conditioners, I only improve the quality in five rooms. But if I blitz the hotel, over one or two days, and I finally get 67 rooms that are missing an ashtray. When I get the ashtrays in there, and I have no rooms missing ashtrays, then those 67 rooms do more for me than fixing five rooms with air conditioners that may need to be replaced. Why? Because fixing uh, ashtray problems, I improve quality in 67 rooms. If I fix ACs first, I improve quality in five rooms. See the difference? That's the art or the understanding behind quality control or controlling quality. I want to do the things first that have the biggest bang because 65 rooms include, improves a greater amount of quality. So what happens is we put together these big old work order systems and then they get bombarded and they get overwhelmed. They don't know how to categorize things so they're efficient. They don't understand quality control. Most of them don't, I'm just telling you. So they get overwhelmed and then they go right back to where they were. Okay guys, calm down, we're trying to catch up. Now today, as we know, everybody is using apps. Oh, what would we do without apps? Well, we did without apps for years. It doesn't matter whether you do it with manual work orders and checklists or an app. At the end of the day, the most efficient way to get the job done and to cover all of your bases is to focus on one thing at a time in each room. If you give a maintenance man seven things to check in a room, you increase the odds he will miss one. And in this, you lose productivity, you lose efficiency, you make mistakes. And who's going to find your mistakes? Who's going to find the things that we miss and overlook? The things that are broken or scratched or need touch up? The guest. So meanwhile, housekeeping is constantly turning in the orders. We're the ones that get dinged because if something doesn't work, there's only two categories for a guest, clean or dirty. And any problem falls into clean or dirty. Oh, the lamp didn't work, that falls into dirty. It doesn't fall into engineering didn't do their job. They don't think like that. Clean or dirty, a couple of things don't work in the room, it falls in, the room was dirty. That's just how they do it. They don't have time to categorize like you and me. They get overwhelmed and they fall right back into overwhelmed and way behind. That's why the executive housekeeper being the reporting mode and doing the work for engineering. You're already in the rooms, don't be bitter. Make the list, categorize them and give them to the director of engineering. Poco a poco, they say in Mexico. One thing, little by little, one thing at a time and start with your biggest common denominator problem in all the rooms. Because if you're just chasing this thing and you never eradicate it, Whatever the problem is, you're not into maintenance yet. You're not a maintenance engineer. You're not managing maintenance. You're, 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 you're 
You ch- you run around with a, uh, like a chicken with a head cut off. If you don't fix it, housekeeping won't report it. Have you ever noticed? Why is that air conditioner doesn't doesn't have a, a a grill on the front of it? We can see the coils. I've reported it six times. And then after a while, if it doesn't get fixed, housekeepers, supervisors, and director of housekeeping doesn't even report it. Why? They reported it, never gets done. Now, after this big thrust for this work order system, we're right back to where we were. We report it doesn't get fixed. That's why you get a hold of an engineer, and when he's done with every single thing he's got to do, he calls you and you go inspect every single one of them. I don't want to do that. That's their job. I don't have time for that. Fine, your rooms are going to be screwed up. And when the rooms are screwed up, who are they going to blame? Director of housekeeping. Why? You're supposed to report it. And so you see this vicious cycle. I'm telling you how to work with your executive director of engineering and maintenance and do these things and organize these things for them so you can follow up, so you can keep a handle on it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who gets the credit. It matters that the guest has a flawless room. When you don't go to engineering and take away the obstacle of having to walk the rooms, which they're not going to do, remove that. That's in their way. Walking rooms is in their way of fixing rooms. Do you understand that? Well, there you go. How to work with your director of engineering and maintenance. All right, go up there and go find a punch list, fill it out, get the job done. The hotel and hospitality industry is a type of entertainment and a form of show business. Thanks for visiting the Executive Housekeeper 101 with Abel Josephson from housekeepingrehab.com.